Thank you everybody for coming today. We have a big turnout. So um, <clears throat> you know, we uh, appreciate y'all appreciate y'all coming and uh, to our first uh, Doxymia Research Grand Rounds. Um, we've been <clears throat> talking about this for a couple months now um, to uh, have one of us present each month on uh, <clears throat> some of the research that we're doing and, and how it kind of aligns with the mission strategies of Doxymia and, and um how uh we aim to support you know those those endeavors and um uh so this will be this will be our first and uh we'll continue on from here so my uh presentation uh, so we're, we're expecting this to be about like 20 minute presentation uh and about like 10 minutes for questions or discussion um and uh, yeah so my presentation today is going to be on uh, our research on predictors of telemental health provider use of telemedicine. So telemental health being basically mental health provider provides mental health services over telemedicine. Um, but um, yeah, and I guess uh, for those of you who actually don't know me well, um, so I'm Brian Banal, I'm the director of, of Doxmi Research. Um, and uh, I'm also an assistant professor at the University of South Florida here in Tampa, Florida. I'm also a co-founder, CEO of um, Adherly, uh, which is one of our products um, <clears throat> related to DoxyMe. And um, yeah, we'll probably be presenting more on that down the road too, but <clears throat> let's, uh, let's get rolling here. So just an overview of what I plan on talking about today. Uh, <clears throat> just first wanted to give like a brief introduction to DoxyMe research, um, talk about what we do and why. Um, and uh, then uh, talk a little bit about, you know, why would we study predictors of telemedicine use, um, how we've studied those predictors, uh, and what we found, and then kind of a summary and uh, example application of, of that. <clears throat> so those of you who are not too familiar with Doxymi Research, um, <clears throat> we're focused on, uh, we're, we're a group of really academics, PhD, master's level folks who um, conduct scholarly scientific research um, uh, to inform the field of telemedicine and innovation. <clears throat> and um, that includes designing and conducting research studies, uh, publishing manuscripts and academic and peer reviewed journals. Um, and <clears throat> we also write grant proposals uh, for to the federal government and other groups and uh, to fund and conduct research and develop new technology uh, solutions. <clears throat> so our, you know, our, just to differentiate a little bit, we're, you know, we're not really as, we're more focused on the science and the research questions that, and how to answer those um, versus kind of typical like R&D research and development of a company. Although a lot of the work we do aims to inform Again, our you know, DoxyMe's uh, approach to things and uh, innovative technology development and evaluation and um, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> they're related but you know somewhat different. <clears throat> so why study predictors of telemental health provider use of telemedicine? Uh, you know, a lot a lot of our, our work uh, so far in DoxyMe research has focused on. Uh, mental health providers that use telemedicine. I'm just gonna to refer to those as telemental health providers. Um, and that's because they make up about 50, we're, we're probably guessing probably more than that, 50% of our DoxyMe provider users. Um, so that's a big chunk of our uh, our users. And um, it's, it's really always been that, that case, even before the pandemic, um, we've, we've had like just a very large portion of our users were mental health providers. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, it, that makes a lot of sense because mental health providers really were kind of at the were and are really at the the forefront of uh, telemedicine usage. Uh, it, it you know for telemedicine um, uh, for you know healthcare just kind of in, in general, but um, specifically um, early early on, a lot of the, the work conducted at the the vet, Department of Veterans Affairs um, <clears throat> medical centers there. Uh, is where uh, a lot of the telemedicine you know, work began, and that was with mental health providers for the most part. So um, it's 
it's, it's a good group to focus on, and, and we really, um, you know, throughout the research literature, um, refer to mental health providers kind of as the gatekeepers to, to telemedicine um, <clears throat> expansion and, and uptake, and uh, we really found that to be the case. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> studying predictors of use of telemedicine helps us in a lot of ways. Uh, here's just a couple of them related to the, um, <clears throat> the company specifically, but uh, you know, it helps us to know which types of providers we should market to and how we should go about that. Um, improve, it helps us to improve aspects of product um, and services that we provide uh, and also identify and prioritize desired new features and services. I'll um, get more into that a little bit here. But uh, and talking a little bit about how we've studied predictors of telemedicine use, uh, we typically in our work we follow a uh, pretty well-known framework, which is called the technolo technology acceptance model and uh, an advanced version of, of that, the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology. Um, <clears throat> but you know, ultimately we wanna know like why do people decide to use a technology and, and what sustains that use? And um, <clears throat> so before there's use, there needs to be an intention to use, to use the model or to use the technology. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, we predict that um, with in a lot of ways, but some of the main domains that we look at, uh, according to the, the TAM and the UTAU, these, these models um, are <clears throat> um, perceived usefulness. So uh, how much utility can a, a provider uh, obtain or get out of using telemedicine? Um, <clears throat> how is that going to um, improve their practice? Uh, and <clears throat> The next being perceived ease of use. So how easy is the um, technology to use? How simple, intuitive is it? Um, do they have to put, expend a lot of effort to, to use this uh, <clears throat> technology? And uh, next being social influence. So our colleagues and professionals, uh, professional others in their um, field recommending and suggesting using the, the technology as well. And would they expect them also you know, as a provider to be using that um, <clears throat> too. And uh, next is facilitating conditions. So um, is the, um, uh, the practice that they, they work in and they work for, do they feel supported by them? Do they uh, have, uh, um, is there reimbursement? Is there uh, public policy that supports the use of, of that, uh, of telemedicine? <clears throat> and uh, the other domain that we, we kind of focus on a lot is product advantage. So what are the features of the product um, and uh, uh, abilities of the project product that gives them an advantage uh, over using you know, other, other products that of similar nature? And then the, <clears throat> Uh, other domain that really we call moderates, which in, uh, is basically improves the strength of these predictors, um, predicting their attention to use and their actual use of telemedicine, are characteristics of the providers themselves. So things like you know, gender, uh, age, uh, <clears throat> experience with the product, uh, um, profession, and um, you know, other things along those lines. So, we, we study uh, things within these domains and um, <clears throat> in, in the hopes of better understanding uh, provider users, their desires, and, um, and uh, use that to, to inform our decisions moving forward. <clears throat> so here are um, five of, well, there's a, a, a portion of some of the, the papers that we've published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, um, <clears throat> scientific journals in the, the past couple of years. Uh, these are just the ones focusing really on um, uh, provider use of telemedicine and um, future use, uh, intention to use tel telemedicine in the future. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a lot of these are, or the majority of these are, are survey-based studies. Um, we did one Back in 2019, uh, that was kind of one of our first ones. Uh, <clears throat> this is actually before Doxing Research really been formed yet, but um, <clears throat> by a couple of years. But uh, we um, 
also you know, conducted some studies in 2020, shortly after the onset of the pandemic. And um, then we also conducted some surveys in 2021 to um, find out about kind of sustained continued use of telemedicine and, and, and see how, whether these predictors kind of changed over time. Um, <clears throat> and here's what we've found and uh, with respect to use and intention to use telemedicine uh, and like I just said, we did some of this work in 2019, 2020, and 2021. So we, we get to kind of see changes over time in some of these things. It's pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> but you know, back in 2019, with respect to use, uh, <laughs> we found that like less than 15% of providers um, use telemedicine for more than half of their caseload. So um, putting that is 85% uh, of providers were not using telemedicine very much. Uh, at all, um, and uh, and these were tele mental health providers. Like we already knew they were using telemedicine. We recruited them from DoxyMe. So um, about forty three percent of providers reported that they used telemedicine daily to weekly at that time. Um, and keep mind, again, this isn't providers in the healthcare providers in the general population. These are specifically tele mental health provider users. So they're using it, you know not a large portion of their time or caseload. Going on to 2020, after the onset of the pandemic, we saw an increase about 57% of providers were using telemedicine for more than half of their caseload. Um, <clears throat> and about 84% were using it daily or weekly. So um, pretty big jumps there. <clears throat> and then looking at 2020, one, uh, about 80% of providers were using telemedicine for more than half of their caseload. Uh, we didn't really assess the frequency of use um, during that survey. But you know, we see pretty uh, strong increases in there. Um, we also looked at intention to use. So about 71% of providers um, expected to use it more, or 28% expected to use the same back in 2019. Um, and then we saw an increase, again, you know, in, in 2020 of providers that were using Talibus and more regularly. regularly. And um, still about half expected to, to use it more in the future. Um, and about 27% uh, expected to use the same. And then now we see people starting expecting to use, uh, expecting to use it less, which is important um, because we want to identify, you know, who, who wants to use it more uh, or who intends to use it more and um, <clears throat> kind of work with those folks. And then also identify who expects to use it less because then we can uh, find out why and then, you know, potentially change their mind or figure out, you know, come up with some innovative solutions for them to uh, use it more. Um, and then 2021, uh, kind of similar results here. Um, and again, we have way more people using telemedicine for more of their caseload. So we do expect, you know, there just naturally be more who expect to use it less, but the same, same idea applies. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so what we found in relation to um, <clears throat> These, these other domains, like the actual like reasons uh, or the, the, the predictors that influence their intent to use and, and their actual use of telemedicine. Um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to perceived usefulness, um, we found that the, the most significant predictors or the strongest predictors or influencing variables um, with respect to usefulness are uh, providers viewing it as a way to increase access to care for their patients um, and uh, provide care to their patients that they wouldn't otherwise receive. Um, better work-life balance uh, is, um, always kind of came into play and is a strong predictor of that. A uh, chance for providers to expand their practice, uh, in, uh, improve income, um, uh, see more patients without having to you know, grow too much, uh, and relatedly uh, reduce costs and overhead. <laughs> so these are the benefits with respect to usefulness uh, that we found um, to be the strongest predictors of intention to use in the future and, and actual use of telemedicine. Um, <clears throat> with respect to ease of use, uh, you know, it, they, they want a platform that's easy to use for, their, for, for themselves and their patients, but even more so for their patients. And this is something we found, um, <clears throat> you know, over and over again is, uh, Providers, you know, they want their patients to have to be happy and satisfied and, and not be frustrated over uh, use issues. So it's, it's more important to them uh, that their patients are comfortable and their patients are, you know, their, their preferences are being uh, um, met. 
uh, than, than just the providers themselves. So that's that was interesting. <clears throat> um, that's consistent in other studies um, as well. Uh, for, with respect to social influence, um, if the a platform is recommended by or telemedicine in general is recommended by their colleagues um, and used by others in their profession, um, then you know the, they're more likely to intend to use and to use in the, uh, telemedicine in the future. Um, but interestingly, you know, they're a, a less significant predictor, but still important predictor is um, being at the forefront of innovative care, and that you know um, <clears throat> that has a lot to do with their social standing and the type of provider that they are. So. That's something to um, think about. <clears throat> uh, no surprise here, but uh, providers want to be paid for the services that they provide. So reimbursement is you know, one of the strongest predictors. And well, I assume always be is one of the strongest predictors of uh, telemedicine use. Uh, if, if they're not getting paid for it, they can't use it. They gotta, they're gonna have to you know, do something else. So um, <clears throat> that's why we want to um, uh, influence public policy, which affects reimbursement um, to uh, you know, down, down that path. Um, and then, you know, other is uh, internal support, training, and resources that providers have to um, be successful, you know, in their, in their practice. <clears throat> um, and then with respect to the product and the advantages the product brings, uh, technological functioning is, and HIPAA compliance and security are two of the most important predictors, strongest predictors that we see. Uh, so, you know, uh, and, and these go both ways. So if a product functions really well, um, then somebody's more likely to use it. Uh, if there's a lot of bugs and a lot of drop calls and issues, then um, we found that, you know, that's a negative predictor. They're not going to want to use it uh, anymore. So, um, uh, and same thing, you know, with HIPAA compliance and security, those are actual real concerns for, for providers. Uh, if the product uh, provides a cost-effective uh, advantage over others, they're going to be more likely to use it. Um, <clears throat> customer support is actually a pretty strong predictor, and if, um, if the platform, the company doesn't have strong customer support, they're not going to, uh, they would rather go with a, um, a company, maybe it's a less desirable solution, but um, if they get better customer support, then, you know, they're going to um, move there. And <laughs> uh, advanced features like transcription, whiteboard, reminders. Um, are predictors of abuse um, that they want to be able to use those things during their telemedicine sessions. <clears throat> and <clears throat> relatedly, integration with other health IT platforms, so electronic me medical records and so on. Um, and uh, another thing that providers you know, really desire is support um, for, in developing a tel successful telemedicine practice, which is something we're focused on um, this year, especially. <clears throat> and. Uh, with respect to provider characteristics, we, we found that uh, females are more likely to use tele, or, yeah, women, female providers are more likely to use uh, telemedicine, um, mental health counselors versus uh, psychologists, other you know um, types of therapists, um, <clears throat> providers who are serving patients in, in rural areas who are adults, and uh, who are primarily reimbursed through uh, self-pay, patient self-pay, uh, are going to be more likely to, to use uh, telemedicine as well. And these are kind of what we expect, but we, we confirm them in our research. And just to, to summarize um, <clears throat> uh, and kind of apply you know, some of these principles that, for, with some examples, um, <clears throat> or some of the work we've done with examples, uh, Studying predictors of use of telemedicine can help us, again, know which types of providers we should market to and how. So an example from, from some of this work is, uh, you know, we would want to maybe focus on women who are mental health counselors serving self-pay adults in rural settings, um, which is very specific. But, you know, these are, these are some of the areas that we, we want to focus on in getting customers and maintaining customers. <clears throat> um, and the way we go about that, you know, is we want to emphasize things like usefulness of the, of the product, uh, how it's going to reduce their costs, um, how it can improve their work-life balance, how simple it is for their patients and how satisfied patients are with the product, um, and how it's recommended and used by their colleagues. Uh, so they should be doing it too, or they're going to be left out or left behind. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also in improving aspects of the product and the services that we as a company provide, uh, 
a strong focus on technological functioning, so getting rid of bugs, drop calls, uh, audio, video quality uh, improvements um, are important. Maintaining uh, security and compliance um, <clears throat> as well. And you know, with respect to services, uh, we need to have you focus on customer service and, and making our uh, providers feel supported and, and valued. So, <clears throat> uh, and in addition to that is providing them with training and guides because uh, we're the telemedicine authority and uh, we, we need to be providing that support because their practice might not have that. They might not have the training and support that they need in their, in their practice. So um, if we can provide that, that gives us an advantage over other uh, <clears throat> companies and platforms. Um, and you know, another you know, example is um, ability to identify and prioritize desired new features and services that we can provide. So, for example, new features, um, and we've uh, uh, done some of these already, and, and we're working on others. Is uh, transcription, whiteboard features, uh, reminders, uh, and integration with other um, platforms, just epic. <clears throat> and uh, as far as services go, is, is and, and we are focusing on this because um, <clears throat> our, our research has, has suggested this, is we want to support providers in building a successful telemedicine practice um, <clears throat> and uh, support them in billing and reimbursement um, and uh, provide updates in um, on public policy, how that's changing and how it'll affect them and what they need to be aware of and doing to, uh, <clears throat> to um, be compliant and to support think, uh, the telemedicine you know, mission moving forward. I misspelled the word and there, I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> anyway, so here's uh, here are the references for some of our um, <clears throat> the papers that I mentioned earlier with links and um, <clears throat> you can provide later. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it, close to 20 minutes. Um, open to questions, discussion, uh, no pressure. I have a question. Um, so these are all predictors. Are any of them more influential or more powerful predictors than others? Like if you were going to make actionable insights based on this, like you should target females or you should target people that X, Y, Z, how, how would you go about turning any of that from the data you found? So we, when we run our analyses to look at these, uh, we, we do a lot of statistical analyses that um, can look at the strength of the relationships. And we, I didn't include those here, but um, we have published on those and are publishing on those. So we can say, you know, um, and, and we have done this in, in our papers is uh, look at these variables and say, we'll run what's called like a regression or logistic regression analysis. And we say, you know, um, uh, there's this odds ratio that if, um, if a provider, uh, you know, is, is seeing this benefit there and there and our odds ratios were like five to 13 times more likely to, to use the product, you know, so um, <clears throat> we can also look at like the strength of, of the, the, without getting too into the statistics on it, like we can look at the strength of the relations, you know, between the, these variables. Um, and we're happy to uh, provide kind of more specific details on those. That's what we're here for. Um, so. So that was actually exactly what I was thinking. If you did like a stepwise regression or anything like that and kind of saw any main predictors from it or. Yeah, so we, we've done, you know, the, uh, and Hattie uh, is planning on, there is pretty soon you're going to submit, I'm doing edits on the, the manuscript right now, a paper where she's on what's called hierarchical linear modeling. Um, where we um, add, we can see the added value of, of looking at, you know, these different variables and predicting intentions to use post COVID. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's particularly useful because we can see, um, you know, we, we got a lot of people using it right now, like what matters to like, how are we going to keep them using it? And uh, you know, what matters to that? So um, she can, you know, we'll be submitting that soon, but again, we can share those results. If anybody has questions, please do message us. Um, Awesome. It's been a while since I've looked at hierarchical linear regressions, but definitely be interested in reading it once it gets published. So, yeah, we're, we're happy to share that beforehand too. Um, and uh, yeah, it had been a while for me too. So we uh, had to uh, had to 
rush me, uh, or give me a, um, <laughs> an update. Um, so we're, um, Brandon asked, uh, what, what studies are we planning on conducting next and what do we hope to discover and, and what, why is that um, most important to learn now? Um, <clears throat> so our main focus right now um, and moving forward for the next little while here is, is uh, gonna be very focused on um, <clears throat> finding out what it, using our, you know, our rigorous research methods to find out what it means to be a successful telemedicine provider um, and uh, and how we can support providers in becoming, you know, in reaching that goal. Thank everybody for coming out. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, um, you know, we'll be doing these again once a month. Next month, uh, Triton Ong will be presenting on some of his cool uh, work in uh, extended reality. Um, and uh, we'll be really looking forward to that. Thank you all so much for um, coming and uh, have a great weekend.